Hello, I'm Jacqueline. I am an environmental student at Hathaway Bay High School. I am interested in environmental science because ever since I was small, I liked going, being outside and in nature. And I always wondered how I can help the earth and the environment around us. And it's just really nice being outside sometimes. My name is Griffin and I'm an environmental science student at Hathaway Bay High School. I'm interested in studying about the environment because I think we need to conserve our planet's resources so that we can make it a place where future generations of kids can go out and explore nature and appreciate it as much as it deserves. I also think it's really important we keep all the beautiful, amazing plants and animals safe from any harm. Hi, my name is Veronica and I am an AP environmental student at Hafen Bay High School. I am interested in studying environmental science because I love nature and I want to learn more about how our world works. I also think it is so important to learn how we can protect our environment and prepare for a better future on Earth. Today I am here in my backyard in La Honda and I would like to present Miss Lohman from the Coastside Land Trust who will be teaching us all about our local ecosystems and how we can affect them in our daily life. Welcome to Coastside Open Spaces. What's an open space? It's an undeveloped and open to the public area. And we are lucky here on the coast side to have a number of these that we're gonna look at today. Within the open space, each one has either one or many ecosystems. So what's an ecosystem? An ecosystem is the interaction of all the biotic and abiotic factors in a specific area. Now you may have been learning about biotic and abiotic factors already, but let's review them a little bit. So abiotic factors are never living. They're not dead, they were never alive. So an example of that would be the amount of sunlight that comes into a system the amount of water, and that water could come in in a number of different ways. Could be rain, it could be fog, in some places it's snow, not here. Um, and then also the soil, what is the composition of the soil? Is it sandy? Does it have a lot of organic matter in it? Is it a clay soil that, hold, that holds the water longer? Um, and what about wind? On the coast side here, wind is a really important abiotic factor. And you can really see the effects of wind on the plants. I think uh, Ms. Corelli, if you've heard her uh, lecture already, mentions the effects of wind on plants. Now, on the other hand, there are all those factors within the ecosystem that are living. They're biotic. Bio, that root, means living. So microorganisms are part of this that we don't usually think about. And you are actually going to have a lecture later that features the microorganisms that exist in the soil. And so these would be things like viruses, bacteria. I know you don't think of viruses as being in soil, but they are. Viruses really infect um, every kind of living organism. And um, not, of course, they're not the virus that we're so concerned with right now infecting humans, but think about it, many different viruses in plants and in, also in the soil. And then there's fungus. It's another one that we don't think about very much. And fungus is also in our soils and it's a very important biotic factor. Animals, of course, we do think about, but mostly we think about animals that have fur. Mammals have fur, but there are other kinds of animals too. Reptiles, birds, what about worms, insects, and others that we don't really notice as much. And then finally, there's plants. And plants are such an important part of our ecosystems. And they are one of those indicators of the different types of the ecosystems that are relatively easy to see. So how many different ecosystems have you seen on the coast side? Let's take a walk. So the first place that we're going to walk to is the coastal prairie at Wavecrest. 
And there are right here, I have a circle drawn around it, 50 acres here that are protected by the Coastside Land Trust. Now, where are we exactly? Well, up here at the top of the screen, you can see, I hope you can see, Hatch School and across Highway 1, just a little bit of Cunha. Over here, we have the Coastal Trail come the, coming down to the Poplar parking lot right here. You may have walked around this area. It's a wonderful place to take a walk. And then as you come across the Seymour Bridge right here, you get on to the 50 acres. This is an area that is one of the last remnants of coastal prairie on the California coast. Long ago, before there were so many people in California, there was a lot of coastal prairie along the coast, but so much of it has been developed or in other ways um, changed that there's very little left. So some 20 years ago, there are a group of concerned Half Moon Bay citizens and others decided that they wanted to protect this remnant of coastal prairie. And through individual donations, many people giving large and small amounts of money, they were able to protect these 50 acres so that it will always be open space and you will always be able to come and take a walk on coastal prairie. So what does coastal prairie look like? How do you know that's what you're looking at? Well, first of all, it's a grassland. So like I said, you can usually tell from the plants what an ecosystem is because they're the most obvious part. And here you see some grassland with some lovely blue-eyed grass in the foreground. You know, it's interesting to, to think a little bit about why coastal prairie was able to be prairie, grassland, and not become forested or scrub. So it used to be, um, before there were a lot of people in California, that we had large herds of elk, and deer, and they grazed the coastal prairie. And that kept the shrubs from encroaching into the coastal prairie. And the, the native people, the, the indigenous first people here also would burn off the coastal prairie areas. And this, this kept the scrub down also. And that brings us to some, some conversation about competition. We don't usually really think a lot about plants and animals competing, but they do. They compete for space and land, space which is land, and water and other resources, more of those abiotic factors. Now here you're looking at an exotic plant mixed in with some indigenous plants. What do those words mean? Well, the coyote bush that you're seeing right here is an indigenous plant. That means that it evolved in this area and has been here for a very long time. And in fact, before there were human beings probably in California, this coyote bush was here. Behind it, we have some jubata grass. And you've probably seen this. We ha there's quite a bit of it in Half Moon Bay. It is an exotic plant. That means that it was brought in or managed to make its way in some um, in the um, near past. So it has not been here as long. And in fact, the jubata grass is indigenous to the Andes Mountains in uh, South America. So jubata grass um, is quite prevalent on, in many areas on the coast. And one of the things about um, indigenous versus exotic is that indigenous plants have had a very long time to evolve relationships with animals. 
that they, they may be predatory relationships or they may be some kind of symbiotic relationships where there's mutual benefit. Whereas the exotic plants oftentimes have no predators and don't provide any kind of benefit to the animals in the area. However, that is not always true. So here you see a jubata grass a frond with a white crowned sparrow eating the seeds. So the jubata, even though we consider it invasive, does have some benefit to other species. And in fact, if you were to go down into, into the interior, down where the leafy area of the jubata is, you would probably find it being used as um, a cover for different types of reptiles and insects also. So we shouldn't think that even though something is exotic, that it has no benefit at all to other species. However, we usually are concerned about too many exotic organisms in an ecosystem. So what can we do about that? That brings us to preserving diversity. If we get an exotic organism, and it might be an animal or a plant or something else actually, although we usually talk about animals and plants, if it starts to overwhelm the indigenous organisms in that area, if it starts to outcompete them, then we get concerned. Because diversity is a really good measure of the health of an ecosystem. Because each species has an important role to play in the balance of the ecosystem. So if you see a field and it's all jubata uh, grass, then there's no indigenous plants that are getting the opportunity. They've been outcompeted. That's concerning. And here is a picture of some indigenous plants that are um, in the grasslands, in the coastal prairie, and you see there's a lot of diversity there. That's a healthy ecosystem. And by the way, this is in the spring, so you're seeing a lot of blooming. If you went there today, you would see few blooms because it's fall, but that doesn't mean that there's not lots of life still there. And here's some more species that are indigenous. We've got some, um, some uh, bees, butterflies, that's a downy woodpecker, all of these. This is diversity in our ecosystem that we don't wanna lose. So what can, and oh, of course, I almost forgot, the decomposers. Here's an, an indigenous species, the banana slug, looking for dead material to consume. Very important, decomposers are a vital place, have a vital place in our ecosystem. All right, so what can we do? Here you see the fourth graders from Hatch last year, along with some Half Moon Bay High School AP environmental students tarping an area. This was an area that had a lot of poison hemlock. And poison hemlock is an exotic species that will crowd out all of the indigenous species. It really doesn't leave room for other species um, to exist. It's just a very good competitor. So one way to get rid of it or to discourage it is to put a tarp down, fasten it down and block all the light. Now, when those hemlock plants try to come up, they're not going to be successful. Of course, you have to wait a few months. And then a few months later, you can come out with some native plants. And so here are the fourth graders and the um, AP environmental student bringing out some tiny little plants. Notice how small these are. They're going to remove the tarp and plant them. So these are indigenous plants that have been raised um, by seed and are now being planted. 
And here, some months later, you can see that same area that was tarped. And it's really interesting to look at this. See the little blue flags? That's where a native plant went in. And these larger plants here, this one is a yarrow plant that was planted, it's indigenous. And over here we have some lizard tail. But right here, do you see these smaller ones? Those are poison hemlock. So even though we discouraged a lot of the poison hemlock with the tarping, we didn't remove it all. And if we want those natives to thrive, we're gonna have to come back in and do some more stewardship and remove some of those hemlocks. Sometimes we use other kinds of volunteers to do stewardship. This is actually on the railroad right of way. And these goats and sheep come in every year. You may have seen them usually in August to clear that area in a very um, ecosystem sensitive way. Let's go to a different ecosystem. Still open space on this, um, the coast side. And this is a coastal scrub ecosystem at Rancho Corral de Tierra. This is much bigger. There are 4,000 acres in the Rancho Corral de Tierra. It is not all coastal scrub. They have many different ecosystems here. So let's take a walk. Here, right here is Farallon View School. You see Highway 1, this is Montera, Moss Beach, here's El Granada down here, and this is the Rancho Corral de Tierra that you see here. Now this is part of the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. So it's protected by the National Park Service, kept in open space by the National Park Service, and that means that we can go for a walk there and our neighbors can go for a walk there anytime we want. Here you can see the, the uh, airport down here. Here's Pillar Point and this is coastal scrub. So how is it different from coastal prairie? You start to see the encroachment on the prairie of coyote bush. So here first we see these smaller coyote bushes and then around we see areas that are dominated by a coyote bush. Now remember we're talking about ecosystems. So what is this coyote brush doing for all those things that we can't see? It's not only providing food in the form of seeds and nectars but also cover. So there are many little reptiles that are living down underneath and some kinds of insects living down underneath these coyote bush. There's probably some decomposers like the banana slug, lots of protection here from predators. And here's some examples here. We have a garter snake on the right and a little fence lizard on the left that were up in the Rancho Corral de Tierra. And here on the left, we have some um, sticky monkey flower. It's a beautiful indigenous shrub. And on the right, this is California aster. And it may not look like aster to you right now because it's gone to seed. So these would be little daisy-like flowers. And look how many seeds. It looks like puff balls full of seed. And Again, something we don't always see, but frequently hear, a Pacific tree frog, probably hiding underneath the cover. What can we do to keep this place um, at a place where indigenous plants and animals can still thrive? And that comes down to volunteer work days. And the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy Conservancy has volunteer, volunteer work days um, frequently out on Montera Mountain and in the Rancho Corral de Tierra. Um, all of these kinds of stewardship activities have slowed down because of the virus, but we will be back to them. It won't be that much longer. 
And our third ecosystem is the eucalyptus forest at Quarry Park, 517 acres protected by San Mateo County Parks. So you live in San Mateo County if you live on the coast side and your county government has set aside these 517 acres as open space and it's open space for all of us, including all of those visitors from over the hill that love to come to the coast side too. So where are we? Well, down here at the bottom, you see El Granada Elementary School. And if we went over this way, we would find Highway 1. So you have to make your way up here to the parking lot for Quarry Park. And you can see some of the trails here. And as you're looking from this satellite photo, notice how heavily forested Quarry Park is. Here we are at the top of the Loop Trail, looking down into Half Moon Bay, and we see a little bit of those forests. Actually, it's a, an abandoned eucalyptus plantation. So back around the, the turn of the century and a little bit earlier, people in California wanted to have more uh, available timber, more wood that they could use for all kinds of, of um, things because remember we were not a heavily wooded area. We were coastal prairie and coastal scrub mostly. And so they decided to import eucalyptus from uh, Australia. So this is an exotic species and they, they thought that they would be able to use it as uh, timber to build furniture, firewood, etc. Well, they, they kind of miscalculated because it actually takes 80 years for a eucalyptus to get big and old enough for its wood to be useful for any kind of woodworking. And so after having planted all of this, this eucalyptus, it was abandoned because it was not economically uh, feasible to use. And also we have in the, this area, not as many, but some pine and some Monterey cypress groves. So this is really a forest ecosystem. Oops, sorry. So within this forest ecosystem, we've got this coast side, um, unusual coast side um, abiotic factor of fog drip. So as you all know, we have a lot of fog here. And when the fog comes in, it, that moisture settles on the leaves of trees, leaves and needles, and it drips down and, and gets concentrated at the base of the trees. So it gives us a moisture area at the base of all kinds of trees. And there are many animals that take advantage of this and also some types of plants. Here you can see a great horned owl that is finding the, this tree or this little forest an excellent place to roost. And he looks a little bit insulted at being disturbed. And here's another organism that you may have seen. Some people call this witch's brew, but it isn't actually, and that, that would be appropriate for Halloween, but it isn't really anything to do with witches. It's called Romalina. In fact, it is the California state lichen. So what's a lichen? Well, a lichen is a symbiotic relationship between an algae and a fungus. So the fungus is providing a spot for the algae, which is a, a one-celled photosynthetic organism to live. And then the algae does photosynthesis and provides sugar for the fungus to be able to live. So they both benefit. But what about the tree? Well, the tree is just a spot for the lichen to live and it is actually not harmed by the lichen. Now this only exists here on the coast because we have fog drip. 
and that lichen, the algae can get water from the fog. It also does an interesting thing that helps us in that it cleans pollutants out of the, out of the air. So it's actually an air cleaner. It provides food for deer and also a nesting material for bir birds. So it's actually really beneficial symbiotic relationship between two organisms. And here's some of the deer that love to eat it. And some of the predators that love to eat prey animals. All of these organisms you can probably find in all three of the ecosystems that we have visited today. So what about stewardship in Quarry Park? Because there's so much eucalyptus, our community and the uh, county, San Mateo County, are concerned about fire. Now, while all trees can burn, no matter what kind of tree, eucalyptus do have a lot of oil within them. So they are a little bit more concerning when we're thinking about fire danger. So CAL FIRE and the County of San Mateo, CAL FIRE is the organization that fights any fires that open up on the coast side um, and in other places in California, have, are creating a plan that they've already started to implement over the next few years to create fire breaks through the forest. And these fire breaks allow an area that will not burn easily because it doesn't have trees in it. You can see right here, the beginning of a fire break right through here. It's gonna, it's gonna discourage a lot of fire because it can't really burn there easily. There's nothing to burn, but it also is gonna give access for firefighters because oftentimes that's the hardest part of fighting a fire is getting into where the fire is. Another thing that they're doing is removing dead trees. Some of our um, Monterey, Monterey pines have uh, died because of infestations of other organisms. And those dead trees are being removed because they too will burn very easily. And also really small trees. You can see if you look at how brushy it is in here and all the many small eucalyptus. This is going to be an area that's hard to get into if you're fight, fighting a fire. Plus these smaller bushes, if they ignite, are going to burn up and get into the canopy of the treetops. So we want to remove those smaller ones, leave the bigger ones and remove the smaller ones. Because there's a lot of a lot of really interesting indigenous organisms in our ecosystems. And here we can see, this is actually near where I live. And this is mama mountain lion, and she has her two juvenile mountain lions. Um, you'll be hearing about these later on in th this series, um, following her. And here you can see what they look like in the daytime. So I want to encourage you to take a walk. And when you take a walk, try to figure out what type of ecosystem you're in. And then think about, is it changing? And if so, how is it changing? What biotic and abiotic factors are at work? And above all, it's important to remember that these open spaces belong to all of us and that we should enjoy them. And thank you so much for listening to, to me today. Sorry that we couldn't be in person. Thank you, Ms. Lohman. Today, following our presentation on our local ecosystems here on the coast, we will be creating an ecosystem in a bottle. What we will need is a jar or a bottle of roughly this size, some small rocks, like these, soil, which is optional, moss, 
and any cool looking rocks or shells or accessories to place into your jar. First step, get your jar. Next, we're gonna be adding the small rocks to the very bottom of the jar. Rocks are important because they allow something for the moss to grow onto and it provides drainage. So add a good amount of rocks to your jar. Don't fill up the whole jar with rocks, but make it a little more than just the bottom. Okay, now once we've added the rocks, the next step is optional because moss does not need soil to grow, but if you want, you can add some soil to your jar to cover the rocks, okay. Okay, next step is you're gonna need to find some moss. Moss looks like this, and it grows in shady and damp, damp locations. You can find moss along the coast on rocks, under trees, on trees, and a good place to find moss is on Prisma Creek Road. Moss is really important because it provides a great habitat in our ecosystems and it helps them work effectively. It allows for water to filter through and moss removes CO2 from our atmosphere. So once you find your moss and get it, you may need to uh, lightly sprinkle some water on it and squeeze the excess water out to just make your moss somewhat damp. And now you could add your moss to your jar. Now you can accessorize your jar by adding any cool looking rocks or shells just to make your drawer a little more fun. So I'm gonna add this shell, this shell, this cool flat rock, and this shell. Finally, you need to seal your jar. If you have a lid, you can just screw that on, but if not, don't worry, you can always get a little piece of plastic wrap, put it on top, and cover the entire top of the jar, and then get a rubber band and you can just put the rubber band right on top to lock and seal it down. Now, the last step is to get your ecosystem in a jar and put it on a windowsill with some good sunlight intake. Now, you're pretty much done and you can just watch your moss grow and you can see your mini ecosystem's water cycle from the jar. Basically, the water from the moss will evaporate and condense onto the sides of your jar or bottle and then drip back down on the moss. This is a super fun activity that will get you exploring the plants outside and around you, and it will allow you to create your own mini ecosystem. Now it is your turn to go out and make your own ecosystem in a bottle. I hope you enjoyed and learned something new, but most importantly, have some fun.